In today's video, I'm going to be sharing with you the seven things that I wish I knew before I started investing in real estate. My name is Sean and I've been a real estate investor since 2016. And to this day, my wife and I own 32 units across the country. In my time as an investor, I flipped houses. I've owned several rental properties. We have one property as an Airbnb. I've house hacked and I currently work as a hard money lender. So I've been around for quite some time. And this video is meant as a guide for new real estate investors who are just getting into the game. And these are the tips that I wish I could have told myself six years down the line. So if you don't want to make any bonus headed mistakes like I did, please watch this video all the way until the end. So without further ado, let's get started. So the very first tip that I wish I knew as a new real estate investor is to not over leverage. One of the coolest things about real estate investing compared to other businesses is that you have the ability to use other people's money, also known as OPM. And the concept behind this is that you're not expected as a real estate investor to pay for the entire property. It's well known in the industry that most people come in with 20% for the down payment and then a bank or other financing company will come up with the other 80%. So you're using someone else's money to help you buy this property. But because you own this property, you get all the benefits from it. You get all the rents, you get all the tax deductions, and you get all the profits when you sell it. So that's what leveraging is. You put 20% down and someone else comes with 80%. Now the problem happens when you over leverage, when you get too much financing. Some people in my space have decided that instead of just leveraging 80% of the purchase, they also leverage the 20% for the down payment and they leverage another 10 or 20% for the construction costs and to pay for the mortgage and to pay for all the other expenses like property taxes, insurance, etc. So they're crazy over leveraging to buy a property. And this isn't even a buy and hold property, right? This is a speculative flip deal. So they're buying the property to renovate and then sell at a profit. But what happens when the market turns on you? Then not only are you leveraged, you're super over leveraged and the property is down. So at some point you might actually owe more money than the final property is worth. And I've seen a lot of people early 2016, they're going through the same thing as me, flipping houses, raising a bunch of money, and then the market turned on them and they owed a lot more money than the property was worth. And so a lot of these lenders were going after them. So in my personal experience, I didn't do that. But what I did was I over leveraged by doing multiple projects at the same time. So for example, let's say I had $500,000 in liquid capital to do deals. But instead of just focusing on doing one deal at a time, I decided to do four deals at a time. So Normally, $500,000 is enough for the down payment, closing costs, rehab costs for all these projects, and enough buffer room in case one of the deals goes south. But if all four deals go south at the same time, then it puts you in a really bad situation. And unfortunately, that happened to me. So if I can go back in time, I wouldn't mind doing projects during that time frame, and yeah, maybe losing money on one or two of them, but I wouldn't over leverage and just put all of my money to work. Because when things happen, you get hurt really badly when you over leverage. Another thing about over leveraging is when you over leverage, a lot of the profit you make goes to the lenders. You're going to be spending a lot of money on paying for the fees and the interest rates to all of your lenders. So even though your ROI looks like an infinite number because you put none of your own money in the deal, the actual dollar amount you get out is a lot less than if you were to just put some of your own money in the deal in the first place. So lesson number one, don't over leverage. Lesson number two is to have multiple exit strategies. Let's say you're flipping a house. The real estate market is very complex and no one knows for sure exactly how it's going to go one way or the other. So some people have these strategies where they're going to buy a house, fix it up, flip it and sell it. What happens if the market turns? They should have another exit strategy. Will this property work as a rental property? Can you convert this property into an Airbnb? What if you're buying this project as an Airbnb and then the city changes the regulations? Does the project still work as a long-term rental? Again, one of my big issues was that I was doing some of these projects without a second exit strategy. So when the market turned, it was very hard for me to then convert it into something else. Right now, because of Airbnbs, you're able to rent out the properties at significantly higher rents to maybe make up for your debt. But one thing that was really hurtful for me personally was that I wasn't able to refinance these projects into a long-term debt solution. So every year I'd have to refinance for just one more year and pay a lot of fees associated with it. Plus these are all hard money loans. So again, these interest rates were really high. If I was able to refinance these properties and bring on some partners, we might have been able to do something else like refinancing this into a long-term play, you know, a 30 year fixed loan at 3% interest. That way the Airbnb would have been successful and we could have just rented it out for many years to come until the market recovered. But because I had no exit strategies, my only exit was to flip it then when the market turned i had no other option so lesson number two always have multiple exit strategies at least in the back of your head lesson number three is to focus on teams and systems instead of on particular deals so when i was first getting into real estate investing i was really interested in looking at the individual properties and making sure that each individual property's roi was good but instead of doing that i should have focused on building the team and the network so that 
I can systemize my deals as they come along. You see, when you're first getting started, there's so much you don't know that people just look at the deals themselves. But in reality, if you focus on the teams instead, then when you get deals, they can get churned really quickly. Let's say you're doing a deal without a good contracting crew. When you get the deal, you're not gonna know how much it's gonna cost to fix a project. You also won't know how long it's gonna take. Let's say you also don't have a lender. Then you don't know how much you can finance on the deal. You don't know how much you have to put for a down payment. You don't know what the rates are gonna be, etc. Versus if you had a system instead, where you know who your lender is, you know what the rates and terms are, you have a contractor, you know how much he charges for a deal, you have an agent that's consistently bringing you business, then it's all a matter of finding the deal and then operating on it. So it's definitely a lot easier to do stuff when you have a system. So in our particular example, we had set up a system over in Georgia where we have a lot of properties in. Right now, our property manager and our agent know us really well. And since we already have the system in place, whenever there's a new deal that you send it to us, we would do a quick review. If we think it looks good, we ask the property manager what their thoughts are. If they agree, then we sign the contract and it goes on. So we can just buy properties over and over again without having to think how to build everything. How would everything work? It's all systemized, so it's really easy to just check the box and go on to the next project. And on the flip side, let's say you just look at deals. You spend a lot of time looking at one particular project in one market, and then you happen to find another deal in another market. Well, just because the numbers are good on another deal, it may not be worth it to then create a whole new team just for that one property. So step number three, always focus on building systems and teams over the individual deals. The deals will come, but you need to have the system in place first. So number four is understanding the different financing options. When I first got started with real estate investing, I only knew about conventional loans. You had to put 20 or 25% down, and they asked for tax returns and income statements, etc. But in reality, there's a lot of different ways you can finance deals. Hard money loans are a great example. You can buy a house in bad condition and not have enough income to support this purchase, but if the deal makes sense, you can get a loan on it. I even had an opportunity to buy a 32 unit apartment complex in Jacksonville, Florida a few years ago, but because I couldn't find financing, I lost a deal. And that same deal was offered to me at $1.35 million. And just a few years later, the new buyer sold that property for $2 million. So I lost out on a huge opportunity because I couldn't find financing on that particular deal. When you're first getting started, understand your different financing options, make a lot of phone calls, call different banks, find out their terms, you know, how to do business with them. Because at the end of the day, money is out there. You just need to go out there and find it. And number five, tying into the last one is you actually don't need 20% down. What you really need are good partners and potential private money lenders. Now this tip kind of contradicts tip number one a little bit because I said don't over leverage, but tip number five is different in that you're trying to find partners, okay? You wanna find partners and private money lenders who really believe in your deal. And again, as long as you build your systems, you build your business and you find a great deal, it won't be hard to raise funds. It's hard to raise funds when you don't have a good deal. So as an example, let's say you're buying a property in the Bay Area where all the other properties are worth $1 million easy and you happen to find one for $500,000. Do you think it's really going to be that difficult to get someone to pitch in money with you if they really believe in the deal? It's not. One of our friends did the exact same thing. He found a deal and he found an equity partner to put the other 10% down and fund the rehab budget. And when all was said and done and they sold the property, they made over $350,000 in profit. My friend put in none of the money and because of the way the equity was split, he personally made $300,000 from that one deal alone. It's not common, but it is possible. And if you find an amazing deal, finding the money to go with it is not hard. You just need to find good deals. So tip number five, you don't always need 20%. You need private money lenders and private equity partners. Tip number six is that flipping and wholesaling is cool, but buy and hold is where the real wealth comes. When you're flipping a home or you're wholesaling a deal, you can make a lot of income. Don't get me wrong. But the issue is once you flip the house or once you wholesale that deal, it's done. You don't make any more money from that project. And on top of that, you're taxed on that income at a very high rate because you're doing it on a yearly basis. So it's taxed at ordinary income levels. Whereas for buy and hold real estate, you take advantage of depreciation, you have a lot of other tax benefits, the property appreciates over time as you hold it, and you get rents. So it's a little bit slower, but you make more money over time. And like I mentioned, as you hold on to properties, they tend to appreciate over time, even though you don't do any work to it. I know many flippers who are very active in the flipping game in the early 2010s, and they were flipping homes in Oakland when they were only $200,000 to $400,000. So they were making decent profit, maybe $50,000 here and there per deal. But then if you look a few years later, if they had held on to those same properties, they would have made an additional $400,000 to $600,000 on those same houses without having to do any extra work because of the appreciation in that market. So tip number six, you know, buying and wholesaling is cool, but real wealth, real generational wealth is from buy and hold. And that's for our real estate portfolio. We try to hold on to as much of it as possible. And we only sell when we really have to. And tip number seven is only buy deals. 
Sometimes when you are hanging out with other real estate investors or you are seeing people on YouTube or social media doing a lot of crazy deals, it makes you want to get into more deals as well. But in reality, you need to step back and make sure that you are only buying good deals and you're not buying properties just for sake of buying properties. Because sometimes sitting on cash is the right thing to do. In my example, I did a really great flip in the end of 2017, but I couldn't find another deal until May of 2018. During that six month time frame from when I sold my last deal to when I was looking at the other one, I had seen a lot of my other real estate investor friends buying properties, flipping them and making a lot of profit. And I saw the market going up and up and up and up. And so I thought, okay, the market is gonna continue going up. Let me buy the next deal that comes my way because the market will continue going up and I might get carried from it. Unfortunately, as we know now, that didn't happen. The market turned on me, so I ended up buying at a high and selling at a low. And that purchase was made because of FOMO. I was scared of missing out from that booming market. I wanted to get back into it. You know, I wanted to do more fix and flip. But in reality, the best move probably would have been to just chill, evaluate the market, understand that it was very hot at the time, and that maybe a better strategy would have been to just sit on my cash or buy some more rental properties. But instead I got greedy, I wanted to get in on it, the deal wasn't that great, so I really just shouldn't have bought a deal in the first place. So tip number seven that I could tell my older self is to only buy deals. So these were the seven tips that I wish that I knew before I started investing in real estate. Hopefully you guys all found great value out of this as well. Thanks for watching guys, and I'll see you next time. Take care.